from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Prints and the Photographs Division of the Library of Congress and its Center for Architecture, Design, and Engineering, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's lecture, Tracking Time, Twin Towers, and Mortar City by the distinguished American photographer and documentarian, Camilo Jose Vergara followed by a book signing of his newly published book, Detroit is No Dry Bones. My name is Mari Nakahara. I'm a curator of architecture, design, and engineering at the P&P we call Prints and Photographs Division. I have been in this position for the last one year and nine months. In comparison with my predecessor, Ford Petres, he's there. Uh, his career is, was 40 years and he retired this April. I am still a baby. I'm still <laughs> trying to learn many things of the prints and the photographs division collection, especially related to architecture, design, and engineering, which actually pertains to about four million items. In my early stage of the learning, Mr. Vergara's photographs caught my eye. Having a background as an architecture historian, and as a former resident of New York City, I have been paying attention to changes in the city. When I visited Detroit, the hometown of my husband, uh, in 2007 for the first time, I was very much fascinated by the building in that city, beautiful Art Deco building, and then I couldn't find out why this city actually deteriorated that much. Then I got so much interested in knowing the history of that city. Mr. Vergara's photography resonated with these personal curiosities. This summer, when the library received from Mr. Vergara a series of World Trade Center photographs, I actually caught my breath for a moment, recalling the time and the difficulties that I went through in New York City in 2001 as a new immigrant to this country. That became a trigger for me to host today's event. This is the first event, uh, lecture event, which I coordinated as a curator for architecture, design, and engineering. Let me introduce Camilo a little bit. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't have any connection <laughs> trouble. <laughs> Uh, Camilo Jose Vergara was born in Chile in 1949 and is a formally trained sociologist and writer as well as one of the top documentary photographers working today. His acclaimed books include Silent Cities, The Evolution of the American Cemetery in 1989, New American Ghetto in 1995, American Ruins in 1999, Twin Towers Remembered 2001, Unexpected Chicagoland published in 2001, Subway Memories in 2004, How the Other Half Worships in 2005, <coughs> Harem the Unmarking, Unmaking, I'm sorry, of a Ghetto in 2013, and Detroit is No Dry Bones, published this year, which is available for purchase after this lecture. The website, which you are seeing here, Invincible Cities, has made his work better known through a special map-based interface. I played around a little bit. I strongly suggest you do the same. It's really interesting, chronological order, the cities and the locations. You can see how the city has been changing. A MacArthur Fellow Genius Award in 2002 recognized the exceptional stature of Bergara's work. In 2013, Bergara became the first photographer to receive the President National Humanities Medal. 
In 2013, Vergara selected the Library of Congress, thanks to him, to be the permanent home for his photographic archive. Our previous acquisition of Vergara's work were the series of Silent Cities, which is documenting cemeteries across the United States between 1976 and 1989, and Twin Towers Remembered, which is recording that World Trade Center in New York City between 1970 and 2001. As of today, approximately 8,000 photographs have been transferred to the library, and the full archive is expected to offer about 10,000 images spanning the 1970s through the 2010s. Before introducing Camilo, please note that this event is being uh, videotaped for the broadcast on the library's website and other media. We encourage you in the audience to ask questions and offer comments during the question and answer period. But please realize that in participating in the Q&A period, you will be consenting to the library, possibly reproducing and transmitting your remarks. Finally, please join me in welcoming Camilo Jose Vergara. Thank you very much, Mary. A uh, couple of things. She made me five years younger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, uh, very grateful for that. <laughs> so you can just. <laughs> yes. I'm also very happy to see Helena here and to see Floyd, and certainly Mary and Phil that's uh, doing this wonderful work, putting this uh, exhibition together, this uh, collection together. Uh, And uh, every time I come here, I find this place friendlier and friendlier. I just, uh, it just, uh, it, it's amazing when you start doing photography all over the country and start going to different places to present your work. Uh, after you go back and back and back, you just feel at home in the different places. And it's just, uh, it's just a, a wonderful feeling. So, I want to start with the uh, section from Detroit here, uh, then show a few pictures of the World Trade Center series. And uh, somewhere along the line, I will explain how the title came about that you will see. So Detroit is no, no dry bones. Uh, my first encounter with the city of Detroit <coughs> was, uh, it, it set me into a feeling of unbelief. And it was unbelief because, not that I hadn't seen skyscrapers before, because I had been to Chicago and I had seen them there and I had seen briefly in New York, but I have never seen an abandoned skyscraper. Uh, and I have never seen 12 abandoned skyscrapers. <laughs> You know, that was, that was, uh, <laughs> what's going on here? And, you know, when I ask that question, I take a picture because I'm kind of slow in figuring out things. So I figure I take a picture and then I'll take another picture and then slowly you begin to maybe not figure out how all of this come about, but just have some some sense of direction of what of what is happening between the time you first became acquainted with it and then uh, the time sort of you live off, you know, that you, you're through, you end. Uh, I just, uh, I would look at buildings. This is the United Artists building. The first photograph was a photograph that was taken from a hotel that was at, the, at that time was a Salvation Army building called Harbor Light. And it was taken in 91, that's about 25 years ago. Building doesn't exist anymore, but I sort of almost swore that I wanted to do that, to retake that picture year after year after year. And then the building was knocked off and it was 
before that was cinder block, so I had to stop like at 2002 or three. Uh, and since then, this whole area has been revitalized and, and, and rebuilt the whole empty front. You know, it's, not, it's still empty, but in, within a couple of years, all of that's going to, uh, the picture is going to be a completely different one. Some of the abandoned buildings uh, even this one may be rehabilitated someday. You would find odd things. So I decided that one, one of my jobs was to sort of keep track of things that get left out. So like this man, who was the caretaker of a 32-story skyscraper, called the Broderick Building in, De in Detroit. And that building, you can see this, we're on the roof there. And he told me at one time, you know, we were 15. There were 15 people that maintained this building. And at this point, which must have been around 91, 92, uh, he was the only one. And he could, uh, he was not all that energetic you know, at that time. So, but the, every time I went to Detroit, I would find him and uh, we would go to the roof or would stop in different floors and look around at, uh, at this collection. It was uh, this large skyscraper that you can see in the first picture uh, that had been left behind People had just left, and and there were a lawyer's office, you know, where all the archives were full with stories of divorces, and dentist office that had the, the, the state of the mouth of thousands of people, because there were many dentist offices, and they had a collection of equipment that was uh, 10 years old or 20 years old, you know, that was rusting, and... Uh, and I found that extremely interesting. There was also city offices in some in some in some of these buildings, and uh, and even records. You know, uh, uh, the parole office could be in a building, and then you have all these parole records left behind. There was a section of Detroit. It was like the first wealthy section. It was called Brush, Brush Park. And it was so derelict. This is in 1987. Uh, and I just thought there's nothing that could happen here, but this it's just going to return to nature. Uh, it was a house that was uh, a mansion that was built by a lumber baron. Detroit was in a, in a uh, strategic place. So when the lumber came from upper Wisconsin, you know, through the lake, it would come to Detroit, and that's what got Detroit started in developing a carriage industry. Uh, first there were wagons, you know, and then the, into railroad, uh, uh, into the railroads, and finally into cars. So, so here we're going to see the evolution of this place. This is 91, and you can see the weeds get even bigger. You can also see, and here it's about 2,000, and that's today. And, and I think, I think the, the, the incredible thing is just not only shows the building coming back, it shows how so much of the, what was built around it has disappeared, it's not there anymore, and it shows a blonde woman here. So, so you can, you can fill in the rest. I mean, there used to be a, a first an area of uh, rooming houses. I mean, first an area of very wealthy people, and then it, they became rooming houses, and the wealthy people went to other neighborhoods with larger houses. Then it it was a place for derelicts and and, and people who or homeless people and a few people that sort of hang on to it and then it, it's it's sort of coming back again as a kind of middle class and in some cases upper class neighborhood. 
Well, that one didn't have the same look. This, this one, for those of you who see, who've seen Beverly Hill Cops number one, the cop number one, that was shot in 1984. This you'll see this at the beginning of the, of the picture. Well, that's there no more. Uh, new buildings were built there. I have the picture. I'm not showing it here now because they are compared to this. I mean, these were beautiful buildings that have been lost. Again, if you get far from the downtown and you go, in this case, to the east side of Detroit, you see there is a church, and then the churches would organize this sort of sales of used clothes. And here it's all laid up. You know, and you can imagine all the all the coats. There's hundreds of coats, coats, and those two women selling it. And I thought of going back <coughs> and see what that looked like today. I called the church too. I wanted to know. Uh, I was very surprised to know, find out, that they actually didn't even remember the name of the two women there. <coughs> You know, so that's what it looks like today. This is another set of two pictures separated by about the same number of years, over 20 years. This is the first one, Street. Uh, it's near Eastern Market, for those of you who know Detroit. It's in the east side, too. And what you see here, one of my great interest is uh, it's what happens in between. It's the efforts. I mean, those places didn't just sit there and, and decay, but there were efforts from the city to do things. There were efforts from people who lived there to do things. And I thought it was important to keep track of those things, not just wait until the whole place was level and so a new population, new buildings, new everything came about. So here you can see that at one point the city may have put planters and new trees. You see the planters there. There was a big supermarket here. And this is basically what it looks like today, but you still can see the planters. You know, so you can do like a, kind of an archaeology of places. This is the Packard plant, which is probably the largest of the, of the uh, car plants there, which in, at one point in, during World War II, uh, they built airplane engines there. They built Rolls-Royce engines for, for lots of uh, discoveries were made there, advances. One of them was soundproofing buildings because they, they had to test these uh, aircraft engines, which, you know, of course, they, make, they, they would render you deaf in no time. So. Uh, they had, uh, they did a lot of insulation. Also, because of the temperatures rose so much, they had uh, uh, special ways to ventilate it and air condition it. Again, it was the core of the factory was built by Albert Kahn, who was a great Detroit architect. So here you have it in '91, and at that time the city even thought that buildings like this could be recovered, reclaimed, made into something else. So the idea here, we had one industry that at one time employed 30,000, 35,000 people. We could have 200 in industry, you know, <laughs> small uh, shops here, and each one of them would employ 100, and then we'll be in business. It actually didn't happen that way, but it was sort of interesting to see what would come in. You know, there would be la a laundry, there would be a place that would have used shoes, there will be a place that had cardboard, another place where they took cars to take apart, you know, stolen cars. And then the, you can see the building sort of crumble part by part. And at this point, and this is, I think, this year, it was taken over by some Spanish uh, uh, entrepreneur that wants to make it, bring it back. So he puts the name there. I don't know where he went to Kinko's and made the sign. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here is the Packard sign, which it's, it was fancy and substantial at one point. 
And then he put a picture here that has old Packard cars. So that's the Packard plant. There were other plants like that, and this is one of them. It's a it's made airplane, I mean, not airplane, car engines, automobile engines. And uh, there is a name, Continental. So they continue buildings like this as the other building continue to have a life. They have a life in the internet because you have kids actually go there and I don't know why they do this. Uh, they skateboard on the roof and they do things that you think they're all going to get killed. <laughs> and, then, and then you see those in, in, in YouTube. Also, they go with drones, you know, so that they fly the drones and the drones show you all the crevices of the building, which is sort of fascinating to watch. I was just, I like what's happening to the parking lot there, the way it's cracking and, and it looked like almost like a surface of the moon. There were buildings, this is part of the ruins of Detroit and what attracted me to that, it was a, a, a very, very uh, exciting type of ruins to me, and those were the ruins of the buildings that in my childhood in some little town in Chile, you know, I would look at pictures of them, but they were like the buildings that would be built in Mars. <laughs> you know, I thought that was the future, that was, you know, and, and I believe in the future. I thought the future was going to be wonderful and there'd be going to be buildings like this. But I never thought that I was going to face them as ruins. So, uh, so this building's like this, and I think there's another one here. Well, this is a little earlier. But they were built, this was built before. The one before was built uh, right after the World War II when, uh, when architects spent some time without building too much because it was, the war was there. So they kept dreaming of, you know, this exciting new city, this new, con this new civilization that was going to be built after the war was over. This, uh, this on the other hand, is an old uh, diner. One of many that were built like right around the time of the Depression, right before the Depression, there would be, I think the company that built them was based in Wisconsin. I don't know what the name of it was, but they, they built like 30 of them in Detroit. I mean, Detroit was a boom town. They needed cheap places to eat. And then this is like, I'm encountering this building uh, like in its last night almost, you know, because then I started going back and, and it's now abandoned. But you can see there, it looks almost like like there is a, a, a congregation of, of, uh, of ghosts that are <laughs> having coffee and burgers there, except that you they're invisible. Uh, uh, but the light means that there is still some life in the building. Uh, again, there are other buildings that get this new life in, in, in different, ways, you know, it's that at one point, like with the building I show you uh, before, you know, where Eddie Murphy paraded in front of it in 1984, this uh, made Eight Mile, the movie Eight Mile, and you can see Eminem pass by and with some kind of a water gun or something or paint gun, they just shoot at the, at the steer. Uh, so before they did uh, they did the they shot that scene, the designers for the movie repainted the steer. If you go near the Rouge plant, which is on the west side of Detroit, you see scenes like this, which is uh, to, uh, to me where uh, um, extraordinary. I, I just thought that <laughs> yeah, that'd be a house where they wouldn't go trick-or-treating to. <laughs> <laughs> then there was this development that I capture in Camden and Chicago and other cities and that's 
you know, you have a, a, a building that has two families and then one side is occupied and the other side is, uh, is abandoned and both of them continue their life, their movement into the future and I'm very interested in seeing what's going to happen. So you can see the the one that's occupied put his fence on and you know sort of protecting itself. Except that the problem is that if somebody squats here and builds a fire to st stay warm in the winter, the whole thing can burn. Uh, here you see oh, another example of one of those pairs. It's not that the house that is occupied is in very good shape, but uh, certainly better than the other one. And here it's like extreme case of someone that's holding out between two abandoned houses and puts the American flag and it's sort of making an effort to, to stay there and preserve the house. I thought that those stories were important, that, that those stories need to be told and that also they are stories that are very easy to, to ignore or not to see. Then I look at the landmarks of Detroit, of which there are many and uh, very striking. This is a conservatory where there is a great collection of orchids and it's in an, isle, an island that's called Belle Isle, which is a very beautiful place. I, I'm not sure, but I think Albert can design that, maybe Floyd knows. Uh, and this is the Fisher Mansion, and there are several Fisher Mansions. Fisher was a very wealthy man, very wealthy family from Detroit that uh, did the carriages for the cars. So they, they would do tens of millions of them. So you, you can imagine what a big thing that was. And they, you know, houses like this were built by them. And this is the decoration of one of them. It's in an area called Boston Edison. Then again, what uh, what I realized in this in this Detroit, and I'll I'll get later on. I'll get into gentrification and so on, and the, the, the tremendous contrast between the people who were there and lived there and stayed there and their values and so on. I remember reading somewhere the only super Jesus is the only superstar, and uh, and I thought I mean everywhere you go there is Christianity there is a church there is something or other. You look at uh, at the kids that are coming in and they're you know opening up bakeries and and bars and restaurants and shops and so on. Uh, and and it's a very very different thing. You don't see any reference to this uh, to this other uh, life of Detroit where Christianity is important. As you can see, it gets too hot in the summer, so you bring your church out. Plus, it's also a way to pick up. You offer people some food. They sit. They listen to you. Maybe they'll become members of the church. Uh, then this sort of thing, which builds it, 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 it's sort of it's a very very uh, a strange thing it sort of creates an aura of authenticity around the city of Detroit so Detroit it's seen by many people as you know this is this is the real thing this is the place uh, because you see things like this I mean you see the hands you see people do it by hand people put their things that uh, that are not mediated and not going to be found in hundreds of other places. Everything, you know, at least in this place, is this kind of uh, unique, one of its kind. Or like that, you know, so Christ, why not put him in the Upper Peninsula, you know, walking in <laughs> northern Michigan? Uh, or if you have an abandoned building, you know, why don't you, you put stories from... Uh, uh, you know, the life of Christ or something. <coughs> and uh, and then there are this other uh, quite sophisticated signs that you see. And, and 
and there is no place for them to go. So in some sense, I felt that it was my job to go there and photograph, you know, the ones that I saw and put them up and, and uh, make sure that people knew them. Then this all, this, there is this other difference. I mean, this, this need to construct a history, to tell a history. You know, we, we begin with the Egyptians. So here it's the Egyptians. You know, and uh, then here it comes Mandela and slavery gets put in the middle. And it keeps moving to the, to the right. And it ends up with Coleman Young, which was a very influential ma mayor of Detroit. And under his, uh, he being the mayor, they built the Renaissance Center, which is the building that you see here. And also the people mover. Now, in the sort of gentrifier version, or the, you know, the, the, the other version of Detroit, none of those two things would appear because they're considered as huge bundoggles. You know, things that fail, that just uh, uh, waste the money. But, but for the black population, because they were doing, they were built and put there at the time when there was a black, the city, there was black control of the city and the city was a, sort of a center uh, of, uh, of uh, like what you call black America. So that's a detail from that picture. There is something really very powerful about this, you know, just you see all these faces here, you see it fading out. I mean, it certainly didn't look like this when it was first painted. Then the idea that you have uh, this this idea that you have to tell your history. I mean, no gentrifier coming to Detroit says, "Look, you know, my my here is my grandpa. You know, he came from Italy and he brought. He used to cook pasta, or he had. We have Garibaldi here. Maybe the old immigrants do that. They used to do that, of course, because they had statues of Garibaldi too." But today, this, this urgency, this need is felt uh, in, in uh, graphics like this, where you see the Renaissance Center on top, you see the American flag, the, the, the fist of Joe Lewis's fist here. And then you see here, you see Malcolm X, King, and Coleman Young, and the two black artists that uh, in the, lifted their fist in the Olympics in Mexico City. So that, be, that, that is a statement. And, and I would go to sort of out of the way place, really out of the way place. If you want to know where this is, you know, you just, I mean, it, it, it'd be quite hard to find by chance. But to me, there were statements that needed to be preserved, as well as this. I think this is wonderful. It's on the cover of the book, on the, on the back cover of the book. This is a view of Mahalia Jackson. And I doubt that you could get, you know, sort of a better portrait, you know, not, not it's, of course, it's not there. It's disappeared a long time ago. But I'm glad I have a picture of it. Then there is all this kind of uh, naive signage paintings that people put for purposes. I mean, they give dance classes here in this place. Here is a place that fixes cars, and they hire the homeless man, says, look, we got some paint here. Why don't you do something? He said he was an artist, so he did the history of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which for Detroit is just, uh, is just what you need. And, and how do you live uh, in a city with, uh, you know, you have a daycare center. All of your kids are black. Snow White happens to be Caucasian. So how do you deal with that? Well, you paint her brown, or you paint her uh, green, or you paint her, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all this all colors. So you go there and <laughs> you ask these questions, you know, which are made for, say, uh, 
try to find out if this has anything to do with race. And they tell you, no, it doesn't have anything to do with race. It just, you know, kids like this because it reminds him of chocolates. <laughs> there are the inventions that people make to sort of cope with the fact that there are over 3,000 bus stops in Chicago that have nowhere you can sit and wait for the bus. You know, so you, in here you may get rain over, but, but you still have a place that you can sit on. That somebody came up with that. And I thought that if I was writing something about inventions, I would love to write the story of who thought this up and went looking for the tires and found that. I mean, of course, then the city finds out that there is this and they feel ashamed of it and they dismantle it so this thing only lived for a few weeks. But to me, it's, a, it was, it's one of the most important pictures in my Detroit series. What's behind is an old police station. Now, there are other immigrants that come to to Detroit, uh, some of them are immigrants, some of them are children of immigrants, <coughs> and they're Greeks and Albanians. And their specialty is to buy some of the failed Kentucky Fried Chickens and, and uh, McDonald's and, you know, all those big franchises that go try to make a go and can't do it. So <coughs> they build them. And then they put like a hat on top of it that's made out of a material called dry vet. And you can make almost anything you want with it. You can build the Parthenon if you want with, with dry vet. It won't last very long. And if a car hits it, you know, you'll have it all coming down. But the, Detroit has the most extraordinary examples of this, this type of art of if you want to call it architecture or design, it's all over the United States, but Detroit it's, excels in doing it. This is a, you can still see the, the lights from the original White Castles, you see those. Then Detroit, because it got so, it began to get so much attention, you see, and, and, uh, and the eyes of the world were there and uh, and uh, you could do something on the streets of Detroit, and it was better than having something in a gallery, in an art gallery. So then uh, this it works in two ways. First of all, these are students that did a, th a thesis building. There were students at a place called Cranbrook Academy, which is in the very wealthy suburbs uh, of Detroit, north of Detroit. Bloomfield Hills, I think it's called. So they built this house for about $60,000. A family lived there about six months, and then it flopped and became abandoned. And then, of course, the tigers come along. So this is gas, you know, tag all over Detroit is this tag. And then, of course, uh, there was another, there's a local artist that would put dots in abandoned buildings, and his name is Tyree. So Tyree put the dot there. So a few years passed by. Some development came out of the center, and this is not far from the center. And it's in like the largest, one of the largest empty lots in Detroit. So they figured that's what it's going to be rebuilt next. So somebody started an Airbnb there <laughs> and redecorated the house uh, uh, by inviting a muralist from Brooklyn that has some name and I guess is doing some castles and fantasy in that, uh, in that place. This is recent, it's like a year old. You can see the size of the lot around it. It's probably going to be all built very soon. But in the meanwhile, <laughs> you can have your honeymoon there if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> and you get that view there and so on, if you're brave enough. So uh, this is another, it's a, it's a homage to a, 
a graffiti artist from Houston, Texas called Next, who put his name all over the place. It's all over Philadelphia, it's in Houston and so on. And he happened to die. So there is a way in which this, t this artist that they, uh, at least him, and you can see some of their, uh, uh, they, they are on the web, they have little films about, you know, when they go out tagging. And, uh, you know, here he's opening a bottle of uh, champagne. Now the problem was that he was using that menacing knife to open the bottle of champagne and with that, the result of that was that the city inspector drove by and he says, this is inciting crime. So then the lady that owned the building hires somebody and that's what <laughs> it, looks like. it looks like today. Well, the building, the mural continues to be very popular, but for the wrong reason. The people go and okay. see what, what happened to the masterpiece. You know, and here we come to Detroit is no dry bones. So what happens, the, the condition of Detroit becomes famous all over. So there are four designers from Holland that come to Detroit with the great idea, what if we convince ministers, pastors, to change the word, uh, put the word Detroit, wherever they put the word God. So, so, so of course the project didn't do very well because the pastor didn't want anything to do with such an idea. But they went to this church and, uh, and the minister was having a sermon that day and it was about God, God is no dry bones. So then, well, you know, that was their chance to put Detroit. So they put Detroit, so four white women from well, of course, from Holland, uh, did that very neat writing and very neat sign. It's there, and it kind of, to me, it brought together, you know, sort of black culture, a city that it's falling apart and decaying in many, in many parts, while at the same time it's resurging, and. Uh, and this, uh, and this, uh, you know, this attention that is getting, and the fact that people would come as far away as uh, as Rotterdam or some city like that to uh, to do uh, a sign the way you see it. Again, of course, Detroit got Banksy. Uh, they, I'm getting close to the end. Oh, there's probably two or three more. We'll, we'll have a problem with the trade center then. How much of them? Okay. Okay, so the story here is, it's, this is another one of those wonderful buildings that were built after World War II and designed after World War II, and they were like, this is what the future is going to be like. So it's there, and it's, you know, the sign is, it's, Still standing, and then what happened is that Banksy happened in Detroit. So <laughs> he goes and he finds this to be a wonderful place to do a piece of his work. So he puts it there, and within a couple of days, the whole wall has disappeared. <laughs> so, so now there is a big hole in there. I mean, I want to give you a sense of of there are things that I generated from the inside, like all those religious images that I show you at the beginning or the idea of history. And then there is another type of religious images and that those are generated by people from a church in Indiana or people in a church in Illinois. They say, we need to do some good in the world, so why not go into Detroit and do something? So they see abandoned buildings and then they want to to beautify them, to make them more attractive. So this is like a church from Indiana or Illinois that comes to Detroit and, uh, you know, one of the leaders is an artist and then they get some of the local kids to collaborate and they paint these abandoned buildings. 
And, uh, you know, one of them is religious, the other one is ice cream. <laughs> but they are, you know, they, 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 these are the product of a very different culture, and they are the product of this tremendous attention in Detroit. Then there are volunteers that come, you know, they say volunteers that work for Starbucks <coughs> or work for Ford Motor or work for Google or some other place they say we want. They give them a day to go to Detroit or two days, you know, so they get and then they try to create a little park. And then there are the gentrifiers that, uh, that do uh, try to recreate something that, that, that it's like has a flavor of what old Detroit was, but as a friend of mine <laughs> says, he grew up in Detroit, he said, there was nothing like this in old Detroit. Building that was a factory, then it was a, a, an art gallery, and now it's a bakery, which, which, is, which combines writing by hand, seats that are taken from abandoned schools in, in Detroit, uh, uh, little de architecture details that were uh, found, and then attracts a group of people that is a very mixed group of people. And of course, there's a couple taking a selfie there. <laughs> you know, here you have a an old white bread building, and there's a casino that was built using that building rather than demolishing it. Uh, and this is an image of the old Detroit, of the Detroit of prosperity, of the Detroit of money, of the Detroit that, uh, that of the 20s. You know, you see they're putting the money into the vaults there. And the Detroit that was white too, you know, so. So here it's a designer, it's a designer that did a lo lot of uh, uh, work in Detroit. His name is Corrado Parducci. So black artists from the area re react and they say, this is, <laughs> then, no, that stuff is not ours, you know, here is ours. Rosa Parks live here, so Rosa Parks uh, replaces some of the other or it's placed there, you know, as being the right, uh, the, the, the right image, the right portrait to put there. And that's Motown. It's the, you can help yourself to some postcards I have there, the same postcard, and they're right at the entrance, uh, which had, you know, it's quite a small museum, but well attended and, and uh, very popular. Then there is a local uh, folk artist that has her view of Detroit where the local funeral home becomes as big as the General Motors World Headquarters, the old one that is right there in the back. So it's like similar to what we saw with Snow White. It's that, you know, you get, you, you have to play around with the symbols to just arrange them in a different way. Detroit was, uh, and it, it's a very spread out city, it's 139 square miles. It's uh, it reached at one point almost two million people and now it has uh, a little under 700,000. So there is a lot of land and people cultivate that and grow crops as this man. It's a picture from 87. And this is my last picture from Detroit. I don't know if we have time to go into the Trade Center. Very quickly. What? Pretty very quickly? Very, very okay. quickly. So this is like the symbol, a symbol of Detroit, a very important train station brought the President of the United States for the inauguration, I believe it was 1913. And uh, many people went to, you know, they went service the war and so on, you know, from that train station. You get hundreds of trains every day. It's been abandoned for a while. So, any case. So, the, the Twin Towers, it's a, it's a simple thing. It's just, uh, I first became interested 
it's, you know, because I, 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 uh, I was up on the projects. I would photograph on the projects. I wanted to get an air view. I didn't have money for a helicopter or anything like that. So I would go to the public housing projects and photograph them there. So here you can see uh, New York from about 1994, I think. And this is 2001. So what you see in 2001, there is no World Trade Center. And that's like, you know, a few months ago. But what this show, it showed big areas in the foreground so you could see how the whole city was changing. Uh, at the beginning, I was just attracted to that because, you know, I was the tallest <coughs> building in my town was three story high, and I wanted to know what one that is 112 stories would be like. I also had like an attitude, you know, so <laughs> it, it, you've you're in your 20s, you feel, you know, you're being left out, nobody cares about it. So you figure, well, you too, you know, you may be building the tallest building in the world, but there it's a homeless person sleeping right in front of it. So all of this, this are the old piers in Jersey and they have disappeared. This is the beginning when it was built. And this is like the New York of the French connection that doesn't exist anymore, which you, you can, you can, uh, it was in a state of disintegration, so much of it, you know, that, that uh, uh, part of it, part of the impulse to photograph it was that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be there anymore. And the irony here didn't escape me that this was Liberty Drive, and then when the building went up, the new building was called the Freedom Tower. So I took the pictures that every tourist would take. So this is from the Manhattan Bridge, and from that very angle, like if you go there today, there's a chain link fence, but there is a hole where you can put your camera and you can take this picture. The only difference is that I kept taking the picture every year. So this is 79, that's the day of uh, September 11th, and that's like a few months later, this is like 2005, 2006, and that's uh, 2010, you know, and then you begin to see other buildings going up, and you begin to see a very different skyline. There is a new, uh, what they call them, one World Trade Center. That's at night. And that's like the way it is today, more or less. And that's going to continue changing. I mean, it's basically, uh, uh, it's a very, very different skyline from what we saw many years ago. And I'll go quickly through the other series. This. <laughs> This I like very much because it shows the, the church, the chapel, St. Paul's Chapel, that is from the 1750s, more or less. And it's kind of there and it stays put. And everything around it kind of disappears. You know, here is the Trade Center goes and new, you know, some new building goes there. And then the new, uh, one World Trade Center is starting to go up, and there it's completed. So, this is my presentation. I thank you very much for coming. <laughs>
it's sort of a slow process, you know, the disintegration of a, of an apartment building. It's not, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, sometimes a big fire is, you know, it just takes care of it. I mean, if the roof goes, there you are, you know, so, so it's, uh, uh, but I do, f I follow many apartment buildings. Yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah. Still rise. But the old Packard building, uh, I worked there the summer of 65 as a college student. The defense department was there. I worked in the defense department. And I remember going from one building to another building and uh, going through the abandoned parts of the, of the, the, the mm -hmm. car uh, company and how scary it was. You would go through there and you see chassis and, and engines just laying mm -hmm. around, and I would always be looking for the rats to come out. But, but uh, it's completely gone now. Like you said, someone has said they're going to invest in it and rebuild it, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, no, no. There were raves at one time. You know, they had music inside. The the sort of interesting thing is that one thing from Detroit, and from the rest <coughs> of the the country, from the very poor areas, is that what survives and thrives is the music that's created there. Uh, the visuals, not. You know, it's like what was inside the the, the storefront churches that disappears. But the, you know, we all know the Supremes and Motown and, and techno music and so on. Okay. When you started taking photos in Detroit, did you know you were going to keep coming back and documenting, or did that happen later? Like, when did you decide these would become series? Well, you know, it's partly, I think, I, I, you know, with reference to the ending, it's just that the first picture that I take just tries to be a complete picture of whatever is in front of me. And then you know, the picture is like a question, you know, what's going to happen to this place? So, you know, I feel like I have to go, you know, so, so I mean, you kind of arrange your finances and you figure, you know, who's going to put me up? Is somebody going to lend me a car? Who is going to, you know, where I'm going to eat and that sort of thing? And then you figure you have enough money, so you go back. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's kind of my my way and I'm very uh, see I haven't been able to do Cleveland because basically there was no base that I could stay in Cleveland there was no place I would have loved to have done Cleveland or you know some of the cities on the south uh, but uh, but but that's that's the idea I mean and I think <laughs> I think I've, I've had very good luck with American historians and people interested in American culture and architecture and so on. I've had lousy luck with people who do art photography and and want to show, you know, great, uh, the, 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 you know, MoMA and, and the National Gallery and all those places, you know. I've had in a couple of places, I have the Getty or some other place, I've had a few pictures. So it's like a fragmented, it's a, it's a divided approach to photography. It's that if you wanted to make it as a photographer, you know, all the stuff I'm telling you is completely irrelevant. Why do you want to put where you photograph in the first place? Why do you want to give us the, the year? Why do you want to tell us something about the, the evolution and the history of the place? Just show us a great picture, you know, that, an amazing picture. Okay. Thank you very much. And at the end, that you may want to see more Camilo's pictures, and uh, if you if you can actually show it, we have a prints and photographs division online catalog, and especially for the WTC, we have a kind of sequence for the same uh, thing. So I feel we'll upload a little bit quickly. So if you go to the loc.gov/pictures and then do the search, and then you can see all of these World Trade Center seeds by location. So um, please play around and you will see more and more pictures of the Camilo. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and thank you for coming to this lecture. And the books are available outside of this uh, 
building, and uh, in the hallway, Samiro, Camilo is ready to sign on the book for you. So thank you again, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.